Hey, how's everyone doing out there? Uh, if you can, please give me a, a mic check. Let me know how the audio is, is coming in for you guys. Hope everyone had a great weekend. Michael B, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, super chat. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, thumbs up. We appreciate it. Appreciate anything, uh, anything else you can can give us as far as positive feedback including that uh one thumbs down before we even got on the air i guess or right as we got on the air so anyway <laughs> amazing always amazing so let's see polynesian pip how you doing michael b again how you doing um always be funding how you doing first time i've seen your name here welcome aboard michael b yes i hope so silver to the moon um I had a little bit of FOMO this past weekend. I had to go and pick me up some silver as, as well. Um, I, I told myself if it ever dips just a little bit, I'm going to have to go and pick some up. And um, it, it did dip a little bit, thankfully. But I think these dips are going to be a little bit more uh, few and far between. And the lower, the lows actually are going to be higher lows. So I think um, maybe a good idea to pick it up if you can. But the less appreciate the feedback. Um, we'll go ahead and get started soon. Again, appreciate you guys being here. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, and this is our live stream where we do run into technical glitches, host glitches, all kinds of glitches, even comment glitches sometimes from a few of you. But thank you all for being here. I hope your weekend went well. You're all well rested for the week ahead. If you're in Asia, good morning. Um, if you're in Asia as I am, good morning. It's about 9.03 here in Singapore, Monday morning. So let's get this week started with um, with some good vibes and hopefully everyone's feeling good. Europe, it's pretty late where you are, so hope um things are okay and you're getting some, well, go ahead and get some rest if you can. And um, again, thank you all for being here. Pablo Pina, how you doing? Long time no see. Bobby Jones, Ron Leeper, Dan Warsaw, appreciate it. Robert Chapenga, Jay, thank you, Jay. Pudenda Johnson, how you doing? Paul Paco, Vancouver. Vancouver, how you doing? Okay, so... Pretty diverse group once again. Very, very diverse group. So again, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Really do appreciate it. And if it is your first time here or you haven't already done so, please do subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified on new updates and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we really appreciate it. That's the one thing that definitely helps us out the most are those thumbs up. Um, so if you can, absolutely do appreciate it. You can always find us on social media, silverbullion.com.sg. We are a gold and silver dealer in singapore precious metals dealer platinum as well silver bullion sg is our facebook handle silver bullion pl is our twitter handle pl for private limited audio versions bitly bit.ly sbtv itunes sbtv spotify and please do join our crisis tracker group with that telegram app so if you have it on your phone or on your desktop go ahead and uh, join our crisis tracker group Crisis Tracker is the name, and we do post economic, uh, financial, gold and silver news daily, um, once, twice a week, maybe three times. And um, it does kind of help you navigate through through the week ahead and just, you know, be able to see, you know, what's what's going on, what what um, really what's going on. Because the thing is, we don't all have time to to um, look at every bit of news that's going on. So it, 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 it does help quite a bit. So we hope you... Um, you do join us in, in those in those areas. So moving on. Hang on here. Okay, so again, appreciate you being here. Um let's see. Paul Paco, Jay. Okay, truth teller. Okay. Yeah, again, thank you all for, for being here again. We appreciate it. So upcoming guest, a pretty interesting guy. We're gonna have Colin Cattell, who is the founder of and executive chairman of Palisade Gold Court. That name may sound familiar because he was the host of Palisade Radio. He's the founder and executive chairman of Palisade's group. And 
Canada's newest resource-focused merchant bank. And Colin comes from a family with deep ties to the mining industry with many successes, including co-founding AUEX Ventures, the company responsible for discovering the Long Canyon deposit, which was acquired by Newmont Mining for $2.3 billion. And as I mentioned, he is also the founder of Palisade Global Investments, which is a shareholder of Silver Bullion. And Colin and his team are also behind the popular YouTube channel, Palisade Radio. They give great information there, and they have interviews from with experts from the energy and mining spaces. So he's Colin is a really great guy. He's um good to follow. So you know, hope you can um you can by all means make sure to to take a look at that interview. So again, do subscribe, hit that bell to be notified, and then um you should be able to you should get a notification when that interview comes up. Some of you guys have been saying you haven't been getting um you haven't been getting notifications. Um not sure why. Um maybe it's just a it's a YouTube thing. <laughs> YouTube's been doing a lot of things lately, haven't they? But Anyway, Quake Attic, how you doing? Um, again, Bonzo, how you doing? Nameless Truth Teller. Okay, great to see you, you guys. Um, Michael, Michael B., I wouldn't be surprised if silver breaks $20 this week. We are nearing the next big tranche of stimulus. That is true. Fed will continue to print. Again, that is true. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be pretty interesting because I think, you know, guys are starting to, as we're starting to wake up to this. So um, we'll, we'll have to see what happens going forward. Bill Clark, um, again, Vegas Stacker, how you doing? Hello from Vegas. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Randy Osborne, <laughs> I'd have to agree with that. I mean, we are, we are pretty, much, um, pretty much on our own here, which is why it's a good thing to be getting some, some gold and silver. Um, Governments, 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 and if not governments, central banks, you know, they, they seem to, um, sometimes you just got to let things go and, and, and trust people, you know, you, you can't be in every aspect of, of people's lives. Um, but you know, that's, again, that's one of the reasons why we get gold and silver because we, we see these, we see these things and the best we can do is, you know, try and, um, talk to our friends about it or our family about it and, um, just continue moving forward as, as best we can, as best we can. Okay, so again, thank you all for, for being here. Really do appreciate it. So let's head over to our website and see what's going on there. Let me refresh this real quick. Okay, so what we're seeing right now is 1893 with silver. So silver's moving back up. It's getting back to that. 19 range it just touched on 19 last week and then it um it got broken down a bit or it broke down a bit went down to that 1860 level and i think a lot of you guys were kind of relieved when you saw that you you knew it was time to to scramble and pick up more silver if you could buy that dip and i think others you know you maybe you kind of wondering what was going on but sure enough it um it bounced back and here we have gold at over 1800 as well so Gold is is trying to maintain that eighteen hundred dollar level. Pretty interesting stuff going on. Again, download the Silver Bullion, <clears throat> excuse me, Investor Kit. You're going to find good info on silver and gold here, or just basically storing overseas and things like that, and the benefits that it does afford you. This is a free Investor Kit, so do download. Star Storage. If you're here on this page, also just go ahead and click on it. And it's going to take you to that application page. You would just create a new account. And you're going to see that we have different types of accounts for you. A personal account, a joint account, trust account, a joint account with a minor. Uh, maybe you have some kids that are under 18. You can go ahead and open up a joint account with a minor. Company account or business account and a retirement account. If you have questions about precious metals IRAs or you're thinking about it, uh, go ahead and contact us and we can give you information and as well as to point you in the right direction as far as precious metals IRAs. Getting back to more news going on with Twitter, which I like to do some, some bookmarks through the week. Robert Kiyosaki, the eight-year technical chart on gold available from Kitco for free. 
shows gold in perfect or in a perfect teacup pattern. What does teacup mean? Depends. I will buy more gold. Maybe last time I can buy gold below 2000. Others will sell. Most important. What do you think? Get smart. Take care. What do you think? What do you think about Robert uh, Kiyosaki saying um, he may be getting close to the last time he can buy gold below 2000? And what do you think about guys selling right now? I mean, I'm just kind of curious. Guys selling, I mean, you know, in fairness, they may have been sitting on gold for quite a while and for years possibly, and they maybe see a little bit of a, of an exit strategy here with gold going up. But just curious, what do you guys think? You know, as to what, uh, as to what Robert, Robert said. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, sorry here. Uh, silver is D. Tyler. Uh, silver is at twenty five fifty four Canadian, close to new high. Okay, gotta start paying attention to to that one. Okay, it's pretty interesting stuff. But, you know, I mean, I, th I think you got to kind of wonder because, you know, last time around when when gold was, you know, at 1900 or so, gold was at 50 something. It, you would kind of think, well, OK, gold is already at 1800. Why is silver, you know, not even at 20 yet? And, you know, it's a hard question to to answer, except to say, you know, there's a disconnect in the markets. I mean, I think, you know, that paper price is definitely not the physical price. You're You're not going to. You're not going to be able to go into a gold dealer and get silver at, at, at that price, $18, $19 spot. It's not going to happen. So, you know, I think um, the true price of silver is probably, it's probably a lot more than that, 20 30 range. It's just that that paper price saying it's 18 you know, when you really can't get it at 18 you know, it, it, it's a bit, um, it's a bit discerning a little bit too, to say the, say the least. But anyway, nonetheless... You know, I think silver is doing well. I think it will continue to to do well. Uh, stay the course. Uh, Zero Hedge. Teachers Union says schools cannot reopen unless charter schools shut down and police defunded. Um, this one here, try not to look at it from a political aspect. I mean, the way I read this, you know, politics aside, this is really saying things are going to get a bit more chaotic. And, and again, you know, if you do hold gold, if you do hold silver, you know, just as a lot of people have been saying, you know, of course, diversify your assets, but also think about diversifying the location of your assets. Um, so that, that that's why I put this in my, my bookmark. It wasn't for any political reason. It was just more or less to, to kind of um, gauge things. Are things getting closer to stability or are things getting closer to chaos? And once you make up your mind on that decision, I think it's best to to act on it and um, go ahead and, and make a move as to what's best for, for you and your family. CNBC, stocks could be poised for a big drop, according to financial analyst Gary Schilling. Okay, so maybe we'll take a look at this article here. Make sure I'm in the right article. Okay. Hang on, it's not the right one. Gold is the real Bitcoin. We'll get to that one in a bit. Let me pull up this article here. Okay, so financial analyst Gary Schilling says the stock market could see a 1930s like decline. That's some pretty profound words, guys. Um, very profound. Okay, so financial analyst Gary Schilling said stocks could tumble as the economic recovery from the bug recession takes longer than expected that is true you know i think for the most part we were all being told you know this v-shaped recovery you know this and that this and that but more and more it's looking like it's not going to be a v um, it's, it's just not going to happen anytime soon it goes on to say i think we've got a second leg down and that's very much reminiscent of what happened in the 1930s where people appreciate the depth of this recession and the disruption of how long it's going to take to recover uh, so in a CNBC interview, Schilling said the stock market could plunge between 30 to 40 percent over the next year as investors realize the recovery isn't going to happen anytime soon. Um, 
Let's take a look here. S&P plunged in February and early March as the bug spread across the U.S., forcing businesses to shut down and lay off workers. Um, since mid-March, the index has rebounded roughly 40%. Okay, there's that uh, word, <laughs> rebound, recovery. Uh, I'm not buying it for one. It's, it's been a induced Fed injection of liquidity that's been that's been holding up the markets um and it well investors have become optimistic about the gradual reopening of the economy and policymakers have injected trillions of dollars of economic stimulus into the financial system that that is true so that's why i say you know when the economy when they like to say the economy rebounded the truth of the matter is it's being blown up again it's being re-inflated pushing in hot air through through monetary printing or more. Basically, the Fed has their hand in it. It's not a, it's not a free and open market. Early economic data has bolstered the case for a V-shaped recovery where the economy bounces back quickly from a steep downturn, yet some investors are still cautious about the number of cases in the U.S. and as they continue to rise. Many Americans have missed out on the recent market rally with record high levels of cash sitting on the sidelines we're really disconnected guys Schilling said the s p 500's comeback resembles its rebound in 1929 when stocks rallied after an initial crash he warned history could repeat itself with the s p 500 poised to tumble again like it did in the 1930s after the severity of the great depression became clear okay so um I, I just find it pretty amazing the, the words that they, they choose to use. I mean, by no means are we clear. Uh, by no means are we in the clear yet. Um, there's, it, it's not, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I mean, that, that's just my opinion. Sorry about saying that. But, you know, again, this is why, you know, my main concern is more about all of us understanding here what the Fed is going to do, what our governments are going to do, and all around the world and how we basically need to, need to protect ourselves and look at things like wealth protection. Um, you know, it, it's just, if, if you look through all the smoke and everything, you know, we, we do need to start if we haven't started already looking at wealth protection. Um, and that, that's just it. No, no conspiracy stuff or anything like that here. It, it's just things are in plain sight already and we got to do what we, we need to do. William made coup. The scariest graph for the next few years, many banks will need to be rescued. A new banking crisis is only a matter of time. And this is pretty important. Faris, Baba, what we're witnessing has never happened before. For comparison, Lehman, Lehman, remember Lehman Brothers? They were leveraged at 30 to 1. So here we have Salk General, 108. That's their leverage. Deutsche Bank, 74. Group Credit Agri Agricole, sorry about that, 73. Barclays, 63. Mizuho, 61. Mitsubishi, or Mitsubishi, 58.6. Sumitomo, 50.1. Standard Charter, 48.9. BNP Paribas, 48. Unicredit, 47. Santander, 44.9. ING, 34.9. ING Group NV, 34.9, Credit Suisse, 33.4, HSBC, 28.9. You look at this list I just read off right here. All of these guys, they're at about 30% or higher. And remember, Lehman Brothers failed when they were at that 30-point that leverage, I should be saying. They're all above 30. So when you look at this list here, these are all major banks. Most of them are in Europe. A few of them are in Japan. Um, but it looks like most are, are in Europe. So the banking crisis by no mean, by no means is it over. It looks like it's just about to get started. So again, what he's comparing it to is when you looked at Lehman Brothers, their leverage was 30 to 1. And we're seeing guys at a whole lot more than that 30 to 1. So pay attention. Need to pay attention out there. Um, let's see. Nick. Tim Arouse, the Senate Banking Committee will meet on July 21st to consider the nominations of Julie Shelton and Christ 
Christopher Waller to the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors. And it's kind of important because Judy Shelton, she is an, an advocate of, of gold, and I'll play a, a clip on her, it's just, a, just a short clip. Over the next couple of weeks, my guess is you're going to get hit hardest with respect to conversations regarding whether you're the right nominee or not because you've advocated in the past strong money which advocated maybe more of the gold standard. Now that ended in 71, but maybe you can explain to the audience, you know, as I see Bitcoin since April over triple its price, as I see gold going up and down, it's pretty plain to see that the world is desperate for something that is a better storage of money than copy machines that have pictures of presidents are nice colors on them and they're called money. I, I think that when I hear Snickers, when we talk about convertible bonds into gold for various countries, the fact that there's Snickers at all really depresses me. Nobody seems open-minded to protect what's in our wallets. Can you finish out telling me why that potential should be considered? Well, Rick, what I would want to bring to this position is the willingness to examine the fundamental question that I think is at the heart of what you just sketched out. Money is meant to serve as a reliable measure. It's really the key to free market capitalism. You have to send signals about prices by having um, clarity. And money's supposed to be that unit of account that provides it. It's supposed to be a dependable store of value. It's not supposed to be just another government policy instrument to try to engineer outcomes. And what we've seen is central banks trying too hard to do just that. And they've engineered us right into a negative rate scenario, which completely undermines the idea of having faith in the future, which is the very virtue of capitalism, that people have a positive outlook. They think it's worth it to sacrifice the day, to save instead of consuming, to invest that financial seed corn in the possibility of a greater harvest. And, and it's that kind of financial intermediation that actually creates a higher standard of living, that brings opportunity and prosperity. That's what we want to foster, not a continuing uh, speculative game that's just played in a, in a 5.1 trillion daily turnover currency market. Okay, so what do you guys think about uh, Judy Shelton and, and what she has to say? I mean, if, if she gets in the Fed, um I think some things will be shaken up a bit. Um, maybe maybe she can be the voice of reason for, for sound money. Who who knows, right? But just curious what you guys would have thought about uh, what about Judy Shelton and possibly getting to that, that post. Gold, 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 everyone. Trade your silver. Um, I think you're going to get a lot of pushback on that one, my friend. Uh, a lot of guys, they, they're not just buying silver because it's... Uh, cheap to buy right now they're they're buying it because they understand the gold silver ratio and when that ratio does come down uh, they're going to be able to flip it over into into more gold than they would have bought had they got straight into into gold i mean as an example if you if you bought uh, let's say the ratio was 101 100 silver ounces to one ounce of, of gold and you bought those 100 silver ounces and let's say let's just say the ratio went to 50 to 1 you could flip that silver, that 100 ounces of silver, into two ounces of gold compared to if you would have only bought that one ounce of gold at that time when it was 100 to 1. So I think, you know, I mean, it's it's always good to buy gold as well. But I think, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who understand the ratio and they're definitely buying on that that ratio. So that's, that's, uh, that's a good point there. Uh, okay, so moving on. Let's get back to... um that Twitter feed, see what else is, is out there. Jesse Felder, who we've had on before, um, he always has pretty good info. We have entered round two of the jobs apocalypse, the job apocalypse. While round one was a swift reckoning, part two will be a slow burn that sees millions more jobs lost as some businesses reduce headcounts and others shut down for good. And what he's saying is pretty interesting because this word here, slow burn, I mean, first time around, you know, it was, it was just a quick, um, everything just went quick. Everything was shut down basically overnight or not everything, but a lot of jobs basically were shut down overnight, a couple of days, a week, maybe but this time around guys are thinking it's going to be a slow burn. And that is going to mean 
it's going to mean prolonged unemployment. Uh, so that was some um, pretty interesting what he what he had to say there. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that that article from Axios.com. Let me see if I can pull it up for you. Okay, so the second jobs apocalypse. So this week, United Airlines, or last week, warned 36,000 U.S. employees that their jobs were at risk. And remember, well, United Airlines had a pretty big, um, let's just call it what it is, bailout. Uh, Walgreens cut more than 4,000 jobs, it was reported. Wells Fargo is preparing thousands of terminations this year, and Levi's asked 700 jobs due to falling sales. Now, why it matters? We have entered round two of the jobs apocalypse. Those announcements followed similar ones from the Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, and Choice Hotels, which all have announced thousands of job cuts and bankruptcies of more major U.S. companies like 24-Hour Fitness, Brooks Brothers, and Chuck E. Cheese in recent days. So this is it's growing. This is growing. While round one was the swift reckoning that left 20.5 million Americans without a job after one month, part two will be a slow burn that sees millions more jobs lost as some businesses reduce headcounts and others shut down for good. That's the thing. A lot of these jobs are not going to come back. In the first half of 2020, more than 3,600 companies filed for bankruptcy. Uh, just over 600 filed in June, up 43% from June of last year. So how it works, the initial job apocalypse was due to mandated and temporary closures of business. Okay, we all know this part because of the bug. But part two is the fallout from the decline in consumption. Remember, the U.S. is a consumption economy that resulted and will likely include the wreckage from wide-ranging business closures and a reckoning for white-collar jobs. Okay, so that part, again, um, it, it's, I, I think a lot of us, well, I shouldn't say a lot of us. First time around, a lot of jobs were shut down, and, and it happened pretty quick. And jobs were trying to basically reopen again. They were given money, and we'll get into that part in a bit. They were given money. A lot of them, you know, they're still not making it. You know, we, you know, as, as just seen here, United Airlines, they were given a whole bunch of money, but they're still not able to to make it. So that we're going to see sporadic. I think we're going to see a lot of sporadic jobs shutting down and unexpected from unexpected places, I think we're we're going to start to see that as as well. And um, you know, again, this is why we talked about those infrastructure jobs. I, I think it's gonna it's gonna have to come in. Um, you know, and and the sad thing is, you know, it's going to end up being politicized as as well. These jobs are going to be politicized. So, you know, we're going to need them. We're going to need the jobs. Let's just hope you know our politicians can kind of um have a heart, so to speak, and, and just, you know, politics aside, just get people back to work, provide them jobs, give them something that, you know, will allow them sustenance. And, you know, let's, let's just hope that these things can, can happen. You know, let's just hope it, it can, can happen. Lou Groman, given the bug news, if the U.S. stops doing so, uh, he's referring to printing, um, well, if not, I guess buy physical gold because USTs will default shortly after corporate bonds and mortgage-backed securities do, and physical gold has no credit risk. If the U.S. doesn't stop doing so, buy gold, fiat debasement. And this was his reply when um, Kudlow made a statement saying the U.S. cannot keep providing two to three trillion in bug relief every few months. And again, this also can fall into the um, the picture of infrastructure type jobs. So it's pretty sure these things are going to come already. Ben Prentice, wait, only for above two million? This is crony capitalism, folks. Bailouts only for large corporations and friends of Duchin. Rugged individualism. Not sure if maybe he meant rigged here, but nonetheless, for everyone else, socialism. For the rich is alive and well, wealth inequality at ATH. And he's referring to um, Secretary Nuchin saying the vast majority of PPP loans above $2 million will be forgiven. So again, you know, the, the point of this 
politics aside, the, the point of this tweet here was again to show how there's a a huge disconnect. Let me get that up there. A huge disconnect. Uh, this is coming from Ben Prentice, and um, you know he he has a good point there. Can name Coos Johnson, so they will suppress interest rates. Inflation will go a little bit higher, and of course, gold loves nothing more than real interest rates going lower and lower and lower. And this is coming from an an article from CNBC where gold is the real Bitcoin. So let's take a look at this one here. So gold is the real Bitcoin. Trader sees new highs ahead for the metal. Let's see if we can. We can go ahead and play this. Welcome back to Power Lunch. I'm Seema Modi. Gold topping $1,800 for the first time since September 2011. And one of our next guests sees another major goal post ahead for gold. The trading team today is Craig Johnson of Piper Sandler and by phone, Boris Schlossberg of BK Asset Management. Boris, I'll with you, what do you reference, or what do you tie gold's recent outperformance to? Is it the Fed? Is it low inflation? Uh, what is it? Well, I think it's all those things. I mean, I wrote today that I guess gold is the real Bitcoin, a little bit snarkily in my notes this morning. But ultimately, I think what's happening is that the market is making an implicit bet that inflation is starting to pick itself back up. And I think there's a really good reason for why the market thinks so. Because, of course, the G3 central bank balance sheets have ballooned because of the COVID crisis. But what's different now, from the time of 2008-2012 when we had the QE, is that all of that balance sheet has really gone to surreptitiously finance the fiscal expansion rather than just simply drop on the bank reserve, um, into the bank reserves. That means that the money is probably going to make itself way into the real economy. That's very likely going to drive inflation higher. And, of course, if you're going to have higher inflation, the the all the central banks are still going to have to keep rates very, very low because their first and foremost priority right now in a post-COVID world is to maintain um, momentum, to maintain expansion as much as possible. So they'll suppress interest rates. Inflation will go a little bit higher. And, of course, gold loves nothing more than real interest rates going lower and lower and lower. That's just mana for gold. That's why I think it has a chance now to test the 1921 target, which is the all-time high, as we move along. And lastly... The rally in gold has been very orderly and steady. So it really shows that this is very much a long-term investor bid right now. We haven't seen this kind of parabolic rise. Uh, retail investors, Robin Hood, is going in there crazy with the GLDs. We haven't gotten to that point mm -hmm. yet. So I think there's still quite a lot of way for it to go um, as it starts to, to move higher. Craig, Boris just laid out a couple of reasons why investors should be bullish on gold. You're tracking the stock. Uh, what's the next level to watch? agree with Boris. And how do you how do you increase uh, eight to nine trillion dollars in additional stimulus and not expect to get some inflation in the future? So as I look at the chart, Seema, this has been a 10 year base in the making. And as we're moving above this 1800 level, there's zero question in my mind that we're going to trade up toward about 1912. So about another six percent higher. But when you see bases this big, you know, I've always been told by a lot of other technicians, the bigger the base, the bigger the move. And if you just measure the height of that base and stand it up, you could have a substantially higher price of gold in here as uh, you start to break out even above that 1912 uh, level in here. See? So if you don't have gold, it looks like you need to add a little slice to your portfolios. Interesting that it's not perhaps too late to get in. Okay, so that was pretty pretty interesting what he had to say. If you don't have gold yet, um, you might want to consider getting that for your for your portfolios. Okay, so getting back to uh, some of the comments here, um, let me see. I I saw one comment that uh, oops, hang on, this thing wants to play again. I saw one comment that already in in Vegas. Um, there's already second round of of job losses happening um let's just hope things can somehow get get better um for everyone there um rolf steiner yeah print print baby print that's exactly what's going to happen again and, and again you got to wonder you know if, if, if you're holding treasuries and whatnot and you see these this printing or if you're considering buying bonds and stuff i mean just to say it's going to get to a point if if guys are going to be picking up treasuries and bonds they, they're definitely going to want a higher interest rate and the Fed, the economy cannot take a higher, a higher rate right now. And they're going to want more yield. And 
can't give more yield. They're not going to get it right now. So, um, you know, it's, I, I'd say keep an eye on that bond market as well. Um, I think things are really going to take a hit from, from all different types of angles, which is why, again, things like gold and silver, you know, you consider it. If you're not getting it already, really start consider start considering to go ahead and pick it up. Um, okay, some other uh, comments here. FC was in the grocery store today, and the price of everything has gone up about about a dollar. So you guys are seeing some inflation out there, I, I I suppose, right? And things are getting a bit more more expensive. That that's true. So you know we've talked about this before. If we start to see inflation, can it be controlled? I mean, the central banks have tried for how long to get inflation to to start to trickle in, they could never get it. So it kind of makes you wonder if they actually do get it. Can they control it? I mean, they, they couldn't control it on the downside. Makes you wonder if they'll be able to control it on, on the upside. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Going to be interesting. Uh, let's see what else out there. Okay. Um, okay. So let me get back to um, a couple more things that I came across on Twitter and, and, That'll be all with, with Twitter already. Uh, Greg Manorino, Nuchin says that even though airlines are slated to lay off tens of thousands, the government support program for the airlines has been a success. Okay. Not sure. Not sure uh, by what metric he's, he's saying it's a success. This one here, South Dakota considers first state bill to outlaw all vaccine and medical mandates. Um, Will there be a medical refuge migration to South Dakota? And uh, the question this author has here is who owns your body? Uh, now, the thing, what I'm looking at, again, is not the political side of this. I mean, take a step back. And what I'm seeing here is you're going to have people migrating to different states because some states are going to allow some things or not allow some things. And, and people are going to migrate to various states because they have a lifestyle, they have a belief, whatever it may be, people are going to migrate. And if a state starts losing its population, it loses its tax base. And for the guys who remain in that state, unfortunately, they're probably going to get taxed more to fill in the void. Or as mentioned, these states are going to push and push to get those infrastructure type jobs. So again, Keep an eye on South Dakota because, <clears throat> excuse me, this could be a trend where, again, people are going to see things that they like. They may move, and you're going to have states who are going to possibly have a net loss. And the only way to make that up, they're going to have to cut back on services or start raising taxes. So this is why I wanted to put out that article from uh, South Dakota. Again, it's not political here. This is just to, to say, you know, these, there's a lot that's going on right now. And again, you're going to have to make some hard decisions as to what's best for, for you and your family. The best you can also do is maybe talk to your family, talk to your, talk to your friends. Uh, Pablo Pina, PPP is meant for employees. You know, we're going to touch on that. In fact, we're going to get into that because as I went through um, first half of the year, especially with PPP, I wanted to take a look at, you know, which businesses were winners, which ones were losers, uh, probably more specifically the, the industries. And then the last part, I, I came across PPP. And then when you looked at the companies who got money, some had zero employees. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and, and take a look at that uh, for sure. So let's get into that part of the program. So we're a little more than halfway through 2020, and it has, of course, been dominated by two things, the bug and the economy. The bug, the pandemic, pandemic, as some people like to say, is still left for us to question. A lot, a lot of questions out there. Is it real or is it cover? Uh, these are questions from you, even questions I have. And everyone has a different opinion and questions. These questions seems to bring only more and more questions. and. The thing is, what is not left to question, though, is the economy because it's still not doing well. And the economy was chugging along and the Fed was raising interest rates. And in 2018, we saw the market snap. 
and I'll go and show you that that chart of what happened when when the market. So if we take a look at the um the effective federal funds rate, so this is going back to eighty five right now. If you notice, it's been downhill all the way as far as the effective funds rate when they come out every every few weeks or months or so and talk about the they have their FOMC meeting and we're going to adjust interest rates here or there interest rates are staying the same this is what they're this is what they're talking about it's been going down all the way these gray bars are recessions all the way and we're here so let me um pinch this in a bit okay so we're here <clears throat> this is the crisis 2008 you can see it had to come all the way back down to about zero this time around we didn't even make it up to 5% where 2018 was. We didn't even get there. We tried. We got as high as, we, got as high, we were just under 3% and the markets snapped. It just fell off a cliff. Fed had to drop interest rates. And what they had to do was, this is where they were sort of holding back and then they started to taper we're back in this 2019 time frame here when the market snapped they had to return to buying assets they were buying debt this was their their qe so to speak so we saw this happen and you know the fed was raising rates market snapped they couldn't take raising rates and the fed reversed course right they reversed course lowered interest rates and for all intents and purposes started QE again and but they called it not QE this is not QE but the Fed's own charts they tell us a different story as as I showed you there so from that time in roughly which was June July of 2019 it, we moved on into September and then we saw the repo market snap repo market had a meltdown liquidity froze no one wanted to lend at low interest rates prescribed by the Fed Instead, we saw lenders asking as high as 8 to 10%. Remember that day, Fed had to jump in and, you know, at that time they were prescribing, I think, about 2 2.5% and we saw it shoot up to 8 10%. Fed panicked, they had to jump in. Lenders, they were basically saying, no, we don't, we don't want a loan at the Fed's rate. We see something. We see something or we see someone or maybe a few someones Maybe, maybe they saw a bug. Who knows? Who knows what lenders saw, but they were not going to lend at that prescribed Fed funds rate. And of course, the Fed had to jump in. Something was spooking the lenders where they saw risk, huge risk, and therefore raised interest rates if you wanted to borrow. The Fed said, no, no, no. If you boys are concerned, we'll pump in liquidity. And they did. That's exactly what the Fed did to try and calm the markets. We're not exactly seeing that calm yet. So in that time, the Fed was pumping the repo markets with liquidity and taking in bonds. And what they were also taking in as well, pretty quietly, because you weren't hearing much about it, were mortgage-backed securities. Back in 2008, collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs, which were leveraging mortgages, were one of the main reasons for that great recession. So it kind of popped up again. And research showed us that <clears throat> in that crisis, 2008, Excuse me. The repo market was one of the first things to crack. And when the repo market cracked this time, this time around, we were already looking at collateralized loan obligations or CLOs because they were looking to be like CDO 2.0. And which is why if you go back to past live streams, we were pretty much harping on CLOs. And what we were seeing, we were seeing this time around, instead of too big to fail banks, we we're seeing too big to fail companies. And we were right. All of us were right. You know, we kind of knew something was up with those, with those CLOs. Um, and enter the bug. Okay, enter the bug. So here we are halfway through the bug infested and infected year. Governments are planning vaccinations for us, perhaps mandatory. And central banks are vaccinating by injecting businesses with bug money. So let's take a look at how the markets and businesses have changed via the bug and the Fed. Who are the winners and who are the losers? So we'll start taking a look at this article here. I think it's a good place to start because nobody's getting out of this um, 
unscathed. So this is from the strategist of Australian Strategic Policy Institute, coronavirus winners and losers. And this guy doesn't mince his words. So here with a preliminary assessment of losers and winners from the global pandemic, the list is subject to change without notice. Losers, the U.S. U.S. may turn out to be the biggest loser of all. Washington's confused and facilitate vacillating leadership has been so woeful that it may produce a pivot in geopolitical power. And we've heard guys say this. Unconscious of the irony, the U.S. replicated the initial Chinese playbook of denials, cover-ups, and blame-shifting. Pandemic may exhaust. Hang on here. Pandemic may exhaust America's economic capacity. Uh, it is hurting economic capacity, that's for sure, and moral authority of global leadership. President Donald Trump's astonishing display of incompetence to the point of recklessness, harsh words, ignorance, and self-regard had already deepened questions about the capacity of the U.S. as a nation and as a political system to respond swiftly and coherently to the increasingly complex challenges confronting it and the world. So let's move on. China won't be far behind in the loser's sweepstakes. Beijing's behavior in the early stages of the outbreak was inglorious, and many countries and commentators won't easily forget or lightly forgive. For six critical days, China's leaders engaged in a systemic cover-up of, of the dangerous new virus in Wuhan, misinformed their own public, and actively dissembled and denied to the outside world and the WHO, the Chinese government, lied and hundreds of thousands around the world died. And Europe is not off the hook either. European Union let a defining moment slip by. Instead of coming together against a common threat, most countries chose to fend for themselves. Some resisted efforts to share the cost of borrowing to help the worst affected members, showing the limits to EU solidarity. And we did see that. In a block already reeling from Brexit and resurrecting north-south divisions and prejudices. And Italy was pretty hard hit. Remember that part. Um, so we'll scroll down a bit. Uh, so everywhere around the world, they've made mistakes. And they've, they've definitely made mistakes with, with how they've, they've handled it. And the winners, according to this guy, the biggest winners... This author, I should say, the biggest winners in the East Asian is the East Asian model of competence, good governance, and social capital, regardless of regime type. Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Vietnam, Singapore drew on their intrinsic strengths of high quality health governments, social cohesion, trust in public institutions, and keenness to learn from and correct past mistakes so that article there um that's a pretty um pretty harsh article but it's the truth and that, that's one thing we we appreciate we we have to truth is not something that you have to like to hear it, it just is what it is so we we appreciate that from from this author it kind of stings a bit doesn't it but you know as we talked about last week bias isn't everything bias isn't everything so we need to separate the meat from the bone and digest things properly. We got to be able to separate things. Even the countries this author noted as winners, I, I can tell you, the leaders from these countries in Asia also did and said one thing only to reverse course later and turn around and, and, and do the opposite of what they first were saying. So, you know, it's just to say that we simply still do not know enough things, but there are governments that are handling it a bit better and they are, um, what's important to them is, is trust. They, they want to, um, they understand that, uh, people need information and they need correct information that, that they can trust. And, but speaking of reversing course or at least changing course, this is what many businesses had to do to move into the winner's circle according to this article from the Asian or the Nikkei Asian Review, which we'll take a look at. Um, 
So they had a webinar where, where they talked about winners and losers. And um, pretty interesting, though. It was titled after the outbreak, Opportunities and Risks in a Post-Virus Asia, as hosted by the managing editor, Christopher Grimes. The sectors that reduce human contact are still doing well. It's pretty amazing that, that he would say that. Let me share this article with you guys. Sorry about that. The sectors that reduce human contact are still doing well. E-commerce and logistics, said Shotaro Tani, Nikkei's correspondent in, in Jakarta. Again, this is the, the title of the article right here. Webinar shows coronavirus winners and, and losers. Okay, so let me move on. Indonesia's largest e-commerce platform, <laughs> I'm going to get this wrong, Bukalakpak saw transaction volume for April nearly reaching an all-time high. The bug is bringing in people over 50 who don't usually shop online, but now they have to, said Tani, about the positive tide for, for Bukalakpak, whose fellow Asian unicorns Grab and Traveloka have had to lay off or furlough staff. Co-working startups have also benefited from corporate reforms brought on by the virus. A lot of co-working space operators told me they're getting a lot of clients during the crisis. But the shift to co-working may be bad news for property developers and high-value real estate markets like Hong Kong and Tokyo. Companies are giving up permanent space because they don't know how long their business will last. Even before the pandemic, many startups were already trying to reform their business, haunted by cash-burning unicorns like WeWork and Uber. Startups are having to save cash even more because they have to survive the next three or four months, and not to mention the second round of job losses with low expectations of new funding, said Tani. Because it had become profitable and kept overhead low for the bug, Indonesian coffee chain coffee Kenangan was in a good position to raise $109 million this month. A um, little bit more. A larger amount was raked in by local government financing vehicles, which fund infrastructure projects, projects in China. In the four months between January and April, they raked in 966 billion won or 136 billion USD, said Kenji Kawase, Nikkei's chief business correspondent. That's already 88 percent of what they got last year so there is still money out there there's still money out there but so taking a look at this article beside all the mispronunciations there sorry all all our indonesian people the winners low to no human contact isn't that amazing huh so we, we've gotten to that point where it looks like the businesses that are going to do good have low to no human contact Businesses that are doing e-commerce, logistics, and the losers being commercial real estate and China's manufacturing industry. That part, China's manufacturing industry, was a bit uh, further down, a bit further down in, in that article. So with that talk and examples of a second way of knowing how to work from home, telecommute is going to be, it's going to be critical for businesses. I mean, I'd say if your company has not sat down and figured out what your strengths and weaknesses were this first time around lockdowns, what you did good and what you lacked in or even missed opportunities that came about from the lockdown. It's time to do so because the clock looks like the clock is ticking. As they say, fail to plan, plan to fail. Got to plan, got to plan. It cannot be any clearer than that. So let me take a look at few more winners and losers in 2020. Uh, before I do that, I just want to check the, the comments here. Um, let's see. Um, just wanna, I'm a bit behind in the comments, so I just want to make sure I didn't uh, miss anything here. That was, that was um, good to, to share. So, okay. So we'll move on a bit to, to the next article. More winners and losers in business. Okay, so let me scoot on to the next one. Okay, so as we adjust to life with new bugs or the bug around us, our behaviors and habits are quickly changing. What will be the impact of these changes on the organizations and industries around us? Uh, the title of this article is The Bug 
your guide to winners and losers in the business world. And, you know, this is important. You know, we, we need to kind of understand what businesses are, are going to to have a better outlook than others as we go forward. And I'll, I'll wrap it up later on as to why we, we need to know these things. But three business categories, the winners, sectors that'll benefit, losers, sectors that'll suffer, and the in-between are sectors that could go either way. The winners, sectors that have found themselves serendipitously on the right side of history by applying a basic level of competence, they should thrive. The natural strategy for these companies is to aggressively invest in opportunities and growth. So these winners were, again, e-commerce. People are moving into e-commerce. A lot of guys, I know a lot of you out there, even I was doing it. We had to pick up stuff from Amazon, from Amazon or even local local companies that uh, do provide <clears throat> sort of like a, a local type of eBay market, but not necessarily bidding for products. It's just straight products and you could go ahead and buy them and, and have them delivered. So I think those businesses were doing well. Pharmaceuticals looks to do well. Okay, why wouldn't it? I know they're pushing to so-called get that vaccine, right? Logistics, delivery, these are doing well. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us, we have to buy things online. So these types of companies are doing well. Video conferencing, uh, companies like Zoom, they're doing well. A lot of us, we, we've had to learn how to use Skype. We've had to learn how to use Zoom, set up teleconferences, set up group meetings. A lot of us had to learn these things. And then we've learned that we need to get the equipment, whether it's a, a camera or, or a mic, because the last thing you want is to, you know, be some high powered CEO and doing a teleconference and, and having your, your stream looking kind of bad, right? You don't want that happening. Entertainment, streaming, and gaming, Netflix, Amazon, Prime Video, Disney, all of these guys did pretty good. So I would imagine a lot of games, you know, whether it's for uh, Xbox, PS4, I think PS5 is coming out also. I would imagine those had to have done pretty well also. Staying um, at home entertainment is going to do well. Losers, airlines, trains, cruise ships. I think we, we all kind of understand why those were considered to be losers. Tourism, I think we understand why. Oil and gas. That one was interesting. So on January 1st, a barrel of crude oil sold for $67.05 on New York's NASDAQ exchange. At the time of writing, it was trading at around 26 per barrel. So companies' oil reserves are worth less than half that of the start of the year. The value of giants like BP reflects this. On March 19th, it was worth 51% of what it was in the start of January. So it's just to say... Oil and gas, uh, that's, again, a, another thing we, we need to keep an eye on. Investment banking, not doing well, on obvious reasons. Traditional retail, again, a lot of businesses were shut down, couldn't go to the mall. We were staying home. Brick and mortar stores were taking a hit. Professional and sports entertainment, uh, concerts, sporting events, all of these basically had to, had to shut down. Uh, musicians, they were pretty interesting where they would hold sessions whether it was on zoom or, or whatever else uh, so they they would kind of still you know find a way to to get out there and and perform for their their fans cinemas when was the last time any of you went to a movie had some popcorn i can't even remember um in betweeners in betweeners it's the things we kind of already know banking we we don't know which way it's going to go but from that chart i showed you earlier Looks like um, banking's definitely going to take a hit. Healthcare, a lot of it depends on insurance as well. Manufacturing, this also depends on if we're able to, or what we're going to see is companies bringing manufacturing back home. I think this this whole thing was was a lesson learned. So winners, e-commerce. What is e-commerce? Cashless. Cashless. Get used to cashless. Perhaps the second wave is where they start banning cash. May start banning cash during that second wave. Um, I've been, when I go out, there are a few places actually more and more popping up. They don't take cash. And, um, I tell you that that's, um, something to be concerned about when businesses start to not take cash, because that means there's going to have to be an alternative. 
And this is where central banks, you know, probably or may roll out their central bank digital currencies to be a solution for not being able to use cash. So more and more places popping up, not taking cash. So again, other winners, pharmaceuticals, logistics, delivery, video conferencing, at home entertainment, losers, planes, trains, automobiles, cruise ships, tourism, oil and gas, investment, banking, traditional retail, professional sports and entertainment, and cinema, cinemas. So let me take a look at um, more of your comments before I head to the the next um, next article. Um, fat vegan, yes, stock futures are are up. It's it's a huge disconnect, my friend. That's for sure. Um, Noble Sanchez, how you doing? Uh, let's see. David Begley, Walmart is going down. You know, that was interesting because I know a lot of people do go to Walmart. And um, <clears throat> if we're not going to be able to go there, excuse me, we're not going to be able to go there again. Um, they're going to have to have some type of massive way to to deliver things because I, I can't imagine the, the demand that, that they would get for things to things to be delivered so you know it's going to be interesting how, how they have to how they have to work that out um let me see other here other comments here let's see um do you think 10 years from now all banks will buy silver or gold well i don't know if the word all is um all means all but i will say they are already buying it central banks already have uh, gold held in reserves. Um, I think last year or the year before 2018, 2019, central banks have bought more gold than they ever have in the last 50 years. So the banks, they're already picking up gold. Um, so, but for all banks, I can't say all, but central banks are definitely picking up uh, gold. So that's, uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Okay, so let me, let me move on to the um, next article. More winners and losers. So this one uh, coming from Japan Times. If you guys notice, I'm pulling a lot of articles more from outside the U.S. So you folks can get a taste of, you know, what's happening in the world. Okay. Corporate winners and losers in the new bug economy. This is coming out of Hong Kong. Although the bug pandemic has sent stock markets into free fall and some industries to the wall. Many firms that enable more private online and tech-based living are emerging as potential winners. As hundreds of millions of people worldwide are forced to stay in their homes, avoid travel abroad, and the businesses that are helping them adapt could lead to long-term changes in the economy. I think certain aspects of work and organizing will change for good. Change for good. Meaning we're not going back. Um... A lot of things are going to change. People will discover that they can work and commute in ways they previously did not think possible and will be forced to become more nimble. And this has forced all of us to become more nimble with tech through having no choice to do otherwise. So again, e-commerce giants, um, Walmart, Amazon, actually both tumbled as markets crashed around the world March 16th. But during the past week, Walmart rose as much as 25% from its nine-month low. On Monday, let me take a look at this article's date. This was, uh, let me see, can't find the date here. March 22. Okay, so this was March, uh, pretty much at the height of when things were starting to fall apart. So we, meanwhile, we were seeing increased online shopping. As a result, some products such as household staples and medical supplies are out of stock. This is coming from Amazon. Streaming firms. Streaming firms, demand for movies to watch at home has soared so much that Netflix and YouTube are reducing the quality of their streaming in Europe, the new epicenter of the virus, to ease pressure on Internet. Worldwide streaming activity jumped by 20% the weekend of March 14th and 15th. Now, this is interesting. Private jets. Airline sector has been hit hard by quarantine rules and border closures with the UK airline Flyby, Lib, sorry about that. crashing into bankruptcy and experts predicting others to follow. International Air Transport Association said, this is back in March, that up to $200 billion is needed to rescue the global 
industry. U.S. airlines have sought more than $50 billion in government assistance in recent days, with one top U.S. official saying the outbreak poses a bigger threat to the industry than 9-11, 9/11 attacks. So that's, that's, some, uh, that's some pretty profound statements there. So let me, um, yeah, those are some pretty profound statements. So, you know, from that article, I, I would say, again, it's important for your business to start to learn how to stream and, and video conference with quality. And this is a sector that is going to grow exponentially and businesses that do this right, you do it right. You're going to find opportunities that you perhaps never knew that, that you had. So let me take a look at uh, some comments comments here um let me see um see if the it's got a, you guys have been chatting quite a bit so i just want to make sure i get some um some comments in there elbow sanchez the next couple weeks we should oops then put that back in next couple of weeks we should see gold spike silver gaining ground too they've been doing well and, and again you know probably it's because of um, a few things number of things but um probably because they didn't know that more uh, money printing is, is going to be happening it's it's unavoidable already at, at this point so you know that was from japan times and so i want to take a look at another article this one from forbes okay so forbes also has their say too as far as the big winners and losers so far okay the bug has impacted all aspects of our lives and careers. On the other side of this disaster, we'll soon see fast-growing new trends that will dramatically change things. This includes our health, the way we work, where we live, and how we consume entertainment, shopping, and dining habits. Working from home is here to stay. Again, a lot of these, um, what we're hearing now, so-called new normal. A lot of things are not coming back, and we're going to have to do things very differently from how we're used to used to doing them. The work from home experiment was an unexpected success. The ability of people to be productive and remain in contact with colleagues and managers worked so well that companies such as Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Twitter, Google, Amazon, and others have announced that they will continue this program. This is great news for many workers. They'll no longer have to endure long, boring commutes, either stuck on the highway or squeezed into crowded buses and trains. They'll enjoy a higher quality of work as they take back three hours of time without the dreadful commute, spend quality time with their family, enjoy hobbies and attend events for the kids that they couldn't do in the past. And corporate execs recognize that their companies will save a fortune in rent as their workers won't need to be clustered together in office buildings. So again, commercial real estate market is going to take a hit there won't be a need to spend tons of money on high-priced real estate in expensive cities. They could have considerably smaller offices for those who need to be present at the office or simply desire to work from an office environment. So, yeah, you're going to see companies downsize for sure. And the money saved by corporations can be used to further their business interests, perhaps provide employees some much-needed, there you go, much-needed raises and hire new people. Okay, I think a few of us may be cheering for, for that. But there are consequences of working from home. And again, it's the real estate market. It's going to be crushed as a consequence of this working from home trend as big paying clients keep their people at home, fail to renew leases and avoid signing long-term contracts for space. The prices of buildings in New York, Boston, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, and other big cities will plummet. And this, in turn, is going to start triggering other events. Building owners will consider rehabbing their properties. They could turn the offices into rental properties or condominiums, which could help with a housing shortage. These office buildings could be turned into mixed usage destinations that offer a combination of some, some office space, residential residences, stores, gyms, and a host of other entertainment options interesting so real estate commercial real estate is it's going to be hurting if it's not hurting already people are going to migrate to more advantageous places as well high taxation places perhaps like california maybe even my home state of hawaii guys are going to migrate 
they're going to look at places where doing business and taxes are more favorable for them. And if you are looking for um, commercial real estate, I would say it's definitely in your favor to to bargain up a bit. I guess all the realtors aren't gonna gonna like me saying that, but but it is true. It is true. Um, the demand for commercial real estate is is probably not going to be as high, simply because a lot of companies are going to keep guys at home. Don't need such a big office. So um, negotiate. Get the best price you can out there if you're if you're looking for real estate. So this is why when we talked about infrastructure projects again, we made note that infrastructure projects it is going to become political. States that see they're going to have to raise taxes, they're going to want those jobs in their state, bring people in. And a very real question to critically think on is: in all of this, are these politicians as they try to get infrastructure jobs? Are they really fighting for your job or are they fighting for their job, which is power? So we have to be able to see through this. You know, what what is what is the intent? You know, are, are the people we are the people people we putting in serving us or are we serving them? And that's important because they create policy. And with policy comes fiscal policy, um, taxes, services, things like that. So you gotta make sure people are working for you that that uh they put in there. So um, let's see, Ralphsner, people can't make rent. It's true. I, I think a lot of guys haven't paid their rent two, three months or so. I mean, the, the checks apparently, you know, they're enough to get by, but once you, you know, put in rent and mortgage and stuff like that into it, it becomes a bit, um, naturally becomes a bit more expensive. And, you know, we'll touch on this after the, the next article regarding winners and losers um, with oil, we'll get back to the, the politician part and, and what's going on with PPP, where, where's all the money going? Because remember a couple months ago, we say oil futures were selling at, or we saw oil prices selling at um, negative prices. And I want to offer you a different take on the winners and losers of oil outside the big petroleum companies. This kind of makes quite a bit of sense in this article here. Um, again, winners and losers from oil price drop. So the dramatic fall in oil prices may be bad news for the industry, but it's providing a brief windfall for households fueled by heating oil. UK's oil and gas industry is warning 30,000 jobs could be lost as a result of the coronavirus pandemic with oil prices at their lowest in 20 years. That has seen bills for houses heated by oil fall as much as 75%. However, there are concerns that those customers storing additional cheap fuel could be targeted by thieves. About 1.5 million homes in the UK used heating oil, including nearly 114,000 in Wales. The majority of those are across rural access or rural areas where houses are not connected to main gas supplies and they are being urged by industry experts to take advantage of prices falling from 54 P per liter in January to below 20 P in recent weeks. Suppliers say some customers are even buying extra tanks to be able to store that, to store that cheap fuel. So, you know, that, that's the part I found. Um, I did find pretty interesting where, um, you know, did you guys buy extra tanks? <laughs> Are you able to store more uh, heating oil? Because, you know, oil was pretty low back there. And, and what this, this um, author said pretty much makes sense. You know, if, if you were able to take advantage of it and um, stock up a bit, you could get some uh, lower lower fuel prices. So not all is bad. You know, you can be a winner too, right? We all can be winners in this thing. So, you know, again, that was uh, pretty pretty interesting from this article, but now what I want to do is, um, we'll start heading into, um, really the main stuff that, that I think is, is on our minds with, with what's going on. And this article comes from CNBC. Uh, let me just skip through that part. We don't need to see it. So this came out last week. I believe it was last week, July 6th. Okay. It's about a week ago or so. 
Trump administration on Monday disclosed the names of many small businesses which received loans under a program intended to blunt the economic damage from the pandemic. Title of this article from CNBC is uh, Trump administration releases the list of companies that received the most money from small business bailouts. Uh, key points, Treasury Department and Small Business Administration, they disclose the names. The disclosure comes amid demands from Democrats for more transparency. Transparency, it's always good, right? Those loans disclosed represent nearly three-fourths of total loan dollars approved, but a far smaller proportion of the number of actual loans. Okay. So this disclosure comes amid demands, of course, from Democrats, which wanted more transparency for the PPP funds established as part of the two trillion cares act. Okay. So let's just, um, get more into this part here. Politicians and power, right? The law firms, boys, Schiller, Flexner, whose chairman, David, Boys has represented powerful clients such as former Vice President Al Gore in the Bush v. Gore Supreme Court case. They got five million, between five to ten million. Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, her family business, Foremost Maritime, got a loan valued between three hundred and fifty thousand and one million. It's a big difference. Why can't they tell us straight? Chow is the wife of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Again, not being political, just telling you where this money went. Purdue Incorporated, a trucking company founded by Agricultural Secretary Sonny Purdue, was approved for one hundred and fifty thousand to three hundred fifty thousand in loan money. Spokesperson for the Agriculture Department said Purdue Inc. A trucking service said the loan was for about 182,000 and supported 27 jobs. Purdue's adult children are 99% stakeholders in a trust that indirectly owns the company. Of course, he says he did not have any influence on SBA's loan decision. Restaurant, restaurant chain, sorry, PF Chang's China Bistro and Chopped received aid of between 5 and 10 million. Again, it's quite a bit of a difference, which is it? Five or 10. TGI Fridays, which is backed by private equity firm Tri Artisan Capital Advisors, received at least five million. Private equity firm tried to take the restaurant chain public in a deal with the special purpose vehicle. Mm. But that was terminated in April amid market volatility due to the pandemic. Archdiocese of New York got a loan valued between five and ten million. While Catholic charities of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, Washington, D.C., New Orleans, Boston, among others, all received assistance valued at more than two million. Ayn Rand Institute, named for the objectivist writer, cited as an influence on libertarian thought, was approved. For 350000 to $1 million. Joseph Kushner, Hebrew Academy in New Jersey, which is named after Trump's son-in-law and advisor, Jared Kushner's grandfather, got a loan in the range of $1 million to $2 million. I'm laughing because which is it? One or $2 million? That's a difference of a $1 million. I mean, surely um, you could give us a better number, a, a more um, correct number. One to $2 million is, is, is a huge difference. Jared Kushner's parents' family foundation supports the school. Niche movie theater chain Alamo Draft House received a loan of at least five million. Uh, theaters have been closed while new film releases have been delayed. And numerous organizations received PPP loans. Forbes Media got at least, at least five million. Washington Times at least one million. Washingtonian at least 350,000 daily caller, at least 350,000. Um, and the daily caller news foundation got at least 150,000. The American prospect received at least 150,000 political organizations also received loans. Political organizations also. Re okay. Ohio democratic party got at least 150,000 Florida democrat party 
fund got at least 350000 Women's National Republican Club of New York got at least 350000 Black Republican Caucus in Florida got at least 150000 So you can see a, a lot of money did have um, political ties. And, and it's not to say, you know, politicians can't have a business or anything, but, you know, it, it you, I would think, you know, someone should be advising, you know, sir, do you really want to take the money? You know, it, it may not look good in the court of public opinion, but, well, it is what it is. So the SBA released other details. It's approved 4.9 million loans for a total of more than 521 billion. Um, just a little bit more about the, the money here. Applicants in California received most money overall with 68.2 billion, followed by Texas 41.1, and New York at 38.8. Where the loans went? This is interesting. Left side here, average loan size. Average loan 240k, 220k, 200k. Bottom line here, total amount. Okay, so this is the total amount going in a sector, and this is the average loan that went in the sector. So if we take a look at mining average loan, just under 220,000. Overall, that sector got about 5 billion. Coming over here to the right, construction, average loan just under 140K. Construction industry, about 65 billion. Healthcare, social assistance, this industry got the most. They were just under 70 billion. Average loan amount, just over 120K. Professional science tech services, about 68 billion or so is what they got for that industry. And just over 100K was what the average loan was. So this is where a lot of the um, money went. Let me just put this here. You guys might want to take a look at it later on, on, on your own. So these are average loans and what the industry got. And the PPP's goal is to, the goal, it's not what it is going to do, it's what its intent is. The intent is to offer forgivable loans to smaller businesses, helping them to stay afloat and employees to maintain their jobs as the coronavirus puts the U.S. economy on hold. Okay, so look at these words here. Its intent is to offer forgivable loans to smaller businesses, helping them to stay afloat and employees employees to maintain their jobs as the bug puts the U.S. economy on hold. Okay, so we'll move on to this one now, the PPP. So remember, it's to keep employees employed, basically, right? So big business CEOs and the wealthy coast through the process as small business owners are put through finger. This article, I mean, this is a Good one for you guys to look at. So go ahead and take a look at it when, when you have time. Um, so I'll just skip through to the numbers portion here. Okay, so what we're seeing here, what I like to look at is the employees, the number of employees, employee count. Okay, this company here, Amaris, 561 employees. They received almost 10 million. Okay, $5 short of 10 million. Most recent annual net income, they lost 242 million. So they lost 242 million. Uh, this is probably filed with their 2019 um, returns. And they got uh, 10 million. In fact, let me go ahead and, and click on that real quick. And what I'm going to do is, um, uh, let me see. Okay, so what if you do not? Yeah, it's okay. Let's just read the okay, so here we go. So what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is um I'm just gonna look for net loss. Net loss. Okay, and already we see it here. For the year ended December thirty first, twenty nineteen, net cash used I'm here. Sorry about that. Net cash used in operating activities was hundred and fifty six point nine million, which is primarily comprised of our $242.8 million net loss and an increase of $23.8 million in working capital, partly offset by $109.6 million. So this was coming off of 2019. They had a $242.8 million 
net loss. And when we look here, 242, I think it, it may be somewhere else once you factor in a, a few more um, things to close up the books for that, that year. Comes out to 242 million. That's what they lost. So going down a bit more, here's a company with three employees. Three employees. They lost three million, but they were given, sorry, they lost three million. And they were given 673,000 for just three employees. Okay. And probably they were pretty high up. Pretty high up, I, I would suppose. Fission Corp. Advertising and Public Relations. They got $177,000 with zero employees. And last year they lost $9.2 million. Okay. Zero employees. They lost $9.2 million, but they were given $177,000. So this... Um, Definitely want to take a look at this one as well. So this comes in. And just want to take a look at net loss. Now, this is under risk factors. Okay. So they're disclosing some risk factors, but th this is pretty interesting here. So when we look at uh, net loss, we incurred, reading this paragraph here, <clears throat> We incurred net losses of $9.2 million for the year ended December 31st, 2019, and net losses of $3.9 million for the year ended 2018. So they're on a bit of a losing streak here. Since our inception in 2010, we have an accumulated deficit of $31 million as of December 31st, 2019. They're already down $31 million being nine years in the business. Moreover, we expect to continue operating at a loss during 2020 and most likely even beyond 2020. There is no assurance based on our past business experience to support any belief that we can become profitable or sustain profitability in the future. There can be no assurance that we can generate significant revenue growth or that any revenue growth that we achieve can be sustained to any extent to an extent that increases in our operating expenses precede or are not soon followed by increased revenues, our business results of operations and financial conditions would be adversely affected material, geez, materially. If we are unable to obtain significant future financing from time to time, our development and operations will encounter serious delays or can even result in complete failure of our business. Our ability to become commercially successful and profitable will depend largely on our being able to continue raising significant additional financing. In other words, yeah, keep giving me money so I can stay in business from time to time in the future. If we are unable to raise additional financing through equity and or debt sources needed, we would not be able to succeed in our commercial operations, which eventually could result in our Failure. There is no assurance any such additional funds will be able to or available on terms satisfactory to us if if at if at all. So that one, I mean it, it's pretty interesting that a company with zero employees and all they had listed on the website was three guys, the CEO, the CFO, and the CTO, the chief technical officer, officer, financial officer, and CEO. Just those three guys, and that was it. And zero employees listed, and they managed to get, you know, over $177,000 or, or so. And, and um, you know, even though what I said was from the risk factors, I mean, would you throw money in that company with no employees in, in, in a program which is supposed to save employees? And they've been losing over $30 million, at over $31 million they've been losing in nine years' time. I mean... Uh, you got to kind of wonder, you know, what's, what's going on with that, that whole PPP thing, right? So zero employees, pretty absolutely interesting to, to see that. And again, just go ahead and look at that website that I gave you, that, that link. And then, of course, there, there were the, the airlines, um, which is a, another story. So I want to go ahead and take a look at the 
airlines. Um, let me pull it up for you guys. Okay, so it's up here, airline industry bailouts. So when we take a look at this, basically it just tells you the amount of money that, that the airlines got. Um, let's wait for this page to, to open up. Okay, come on. Uh, maybe I'll just go here instead. Okay, so American Airlines, they got 5.8 billion. Delta Airlines, 5.4. United, 4.9. These guys were in trouble. They were in huge trouble. But then you look at executive compensation, 11 million, 14 million, 10 million, um, dividends, 178 million, 980 million. And also they were doing a whole lot of buybacks, over 1 billion, over 2 billion, 1.5 billion, 2 billion. Um, you know, the airlines, they, they were already in trouble in this bug. <clears throat> I mean, the bug really really brought them down so again the bailout amount is here and again they were given 5.8 american 5.4 delta 4.9 united and this again they just came out where what was it Thirty thousand people may be laid off and so even despite all this money that was given to them still not still not out of the out of the woods yet so I'm just curious, what do you guys think of all this stuff? I mean, um, you okay with it? Um, you know, it's supposed to be there to help people with jobs, right? Um, Rolf Steiner, burning pallets of money. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, burning pallets of, of money. Randy Osborne, don't know for sure, but we did see where a lot of politicians had ties to um, businesses that did get money. And again, you know, I think just because you're a politician, it doesn't mean you cannot have a business, you know, but I think, you know, if your business was doing okay, um, maybe just for um, a bit of transparency or, or, you know, like I say, the court of public opinion, do the right thing. You know, sometimes the right thing hurts, but still do it because in, in the end, you know, that, that is what is going to sit well with, with the people and um, you're serving the people, right? So as much as possible, do the right thing as, as, as much as you, you can. And uh, that's, that's pretty important. Um, one last article I want to show you guys is um, something from Google. And this kind of helps with, uh, with us seeing where, where things are. Uh, this is just really quick, something really quick, something to, to share with you guys. Um, Hang on, let me put the screen share up for you. And okay, so these were basically what people are are searching for. Okay, and hotel industry, people aren't searching for that right now. Restaurants, nobody's or it's dropping. Searches for restaurants dropping. Searches for flights dropping. Airports dropping. Tourism dropping. Museums dropping. And then you have searches for Zoom going up, Skype going up, deliveries going up, malls kind of in between or there, shopping in between, or I guess it depends, depends if it was more online shopping or, or retail brick and mortar shopping. But just to say that, that this all definitely jives with, with what we've been saying with the, um, the search, what people are searching for. So, you know, again, businesses are going to change. They're going to have to change. They're going to have to adapt. And as more and more businesses go online, uh, you can't help but to think, you know, people are going to see a less need for cash. And, and as I was saying already, I've been going to places that don't take cash. So it's, um, it's really starting to, to unfold in, in that area where, you know, the plan is to, to get away with, get away with, um, using cash. So, but another place where winds are building, we've got to win, right? That's the objective. We have to win are precious metals and miners. And, and I want to play a clip from Greg Hunter, where he had a recent interview with uh, Craig Hemke and get your reaction on it. So all credit goes to Greg Hunter, USA Watchdog. Recent example, so people understand how eventually this is going to work. With, whether or not JP Morgan and the whole silver thing. Let me just explain to you how this is eventually going to work and give you a recent example so people understand. In May, 
the front month May 20 crude oil contract went off the board and anybody still standing owning one was going to be forced to take delivery. Just like all the stuff I just told you about gold and silver, the same thing works in all these commodities. Whatever the front month was eventually stops trading and it goes into delivery during the month of May. When that happened in late April, I'm sure you remember what happened. Yeah, yeah. There were no buyers. Nobody wanted the damn thing because the oil. because the cushing was full and you had nowhere to put it. There were no buyers. All that was left was people just desperate to get out. And the price went from $20 to 10 to zero to negative 40 because ever, there was just nothing but sellers, no buyers. And so price has to just keep going. That's how it got to negative 40, okay? What's going to happen someday eventually, or whether the, the banks run out of metal or maybe they just decide to stop selling, what's gonna happen, you're gonna get into a delivery phase where there are no sellers. It's gonna be everybody looking to buy, wanting, to, wanting the metal and nobody willing to sell, the exact opposite of what happened to crude oil in May. And instead of having crude oil, which went like, you're gonna have instead. Okay, so Craig Hemke nailed it again. And that was uh, Elbow Sanchez. Yes, that was a great interview for sure. Um, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, um, go, go ahead and um, look at it on YouTube. Craig Hunter's USA Watchdog is a very good interview with, with Craig Hemke. In fact, as Michael B says, best interview of the year could be. Very well could be. Uh, what Craig was laying out was uh, J.P. Morgan's involvement in comics and, of course, silver, which was suspected for quite a long time already. And Craig Hemke basically connected the dots, and um, he had a lot of good nuggets of information. So, again, if you haven't already watched that interview, uh, do do take the time to go ahead and watch it. So, where does gold and silver fit into this? I mean, along with miners, they're going to be some of the biggest winners, in, in my opinion. As Craig Hemke said, guys may not be selling it, and guys are going to be desperately trying to, to get it. So the Fed is creating money, effectively debasing money, and they're going to throw money all over the place trying to get or keep businesses alive and give relief to people. And just about everything else that has gone up since March April, that time frame, more or less was Fed induced. I mean, if we're going to be completely honest here, Fed put money in the market, they injected the markets, and we saw what some guys like to call a recovery, which is Fed induced, okay, plain and simple. But the thing is, miners, they were helped out a bit, but gold, silver, Bitcoin, they were not helped out. They pretty much were not helped out at, at all by the Fed. Yet these have all gained value. All gained value from the markets. The markets being you and me. These are things that the markets, you and me, decided. We decided it had value. I mean, the Fed surely did not inject money into gold and silver. We did. We were the guys who were, who were buying it. In fact, we didn't even inject it. We just knew that this is what we needed to do was to buy gold and silver. And we, the people from all four corners of the world who know gold and silver to be sound, honest, and true money, this is what we did. We went and got something that wasn't helped out at all by the Fed. And, you know, there's simply nowhere else to go. And we're at the end of the rope. Things are going to, things are going to have to change, and they will. Here's the deal. The change that is coming can be either perhaps a better change or not or not a better change and again the truth is this money wealth gives you options gives you options to make a change that you want and it can be as simple as just buying gold buying silver things like that having something outside of the current financial system perhaps even crypto as well and what i'm saying is my opinion is not advice, financial advice, professional or otherwise, it's, it's just my opinion. It's what, what I do. So have something outside of the, the system. 
And you can do this. You absolutely can do this. Money, wealth, gives you options and choices to make a change that you want. Okay. You can do it. Wealthy, rich, average, struggling, doesn't matter. You can do this because things like gold and silver allow you an option for change. And that's, that's the most important thing. They do give you an option for, for change. And, and that's something we, we got to understand that, um, you know, it's not, as I always say, it's not just the price, you know, the, what gold and silver do is beyond price. And, you know, again, as, as Craig Hemke said, it, it may get to a point where it's going to be hard to find sellers and guys who are willing to let it go, understanding the risk that they're taking, they're going to be selling it at a much, much higher price. So even though the spot price is 18, whatever it is, you're not getting it at 18. You're going to be getting it at far above that. And, and as Hemke says, if things play out the way he sees it and connected the dots, it's going to go up. So if you can, just go ahead and go ahead and get some, right? That's, we got to do what we, we got to do, guys. There's wealth protection. We need to understand what wealth protection and stores of value are. Okay. Elbow Sanchez. Getting out of the system was the best move ever. Be your own central bank. Totally agree, my friend. Um, I think it was the best move I, I ever did. I ever did myself as, as well. Good, good comment there. Um, let's see. Magic man. Is JP Morgan going to deliver all the silver through Comex? What they have, excuse me, what they have left now. And, and that's what Hemke was referring to was if they keep playing this game where, you know, short the market, this, that, nobody takes delivery and whatnot. And then, you know, as this last time around showed when guys actually did take delivery, they had scramble and a good percentage. I believe Hemke said 20%, not sure, uh, which is why I go ahead and watch that interview. Uh, but I believe it was 20% or so. They lost that much of what they had in silver. So, you know, they do it again, lose another 20%, do it again, lose another 20 I mean, it's not going to be there. Or maybe they'll do the reverse where you know, try and get silver to go up in price in, in some way. But, you know, nonetheless, you know, from what Hemke was saying, Craig Hemke was saying, this is something we all got to keep an eye on. And, and again, you know, if, if uh, these things can be complicated, sure. Uh, but the easiest thing to do, the most uncomplicated thing to do, get some gold, get some silver, and, you know, have enough what you're comfortable with holding on you and, and for other guys, Maybe a good idea to keep it in a different jurisdiction, spread it around. Because as we've seen, you know, with things like defunding police and things like that, you got to ask yourself, where you live, is it headed more towards stability or chaos? And if it's headed more toward chaos, then you got to think about what you, you need to do to, to protect what you have and, and even even your, your family. Okay, so I'll take a look at a few more comments and, and I'll head out. Sorry, we've been on kind of long here. Um, Anyway, um, let's see. Um, Neophyte stacker, insane to think that a very small population buys precious metals. It's true. But with more signs of recession, bad times, more information available. If more are introduced, what will spot price be in 10 years or even less? I mean, can you imagine if even, um, I don't know, let's say what, another 5%, 3 5% of a, population woke up and said, Hey, I better get me some silver or gold silver may not be anymore, <laughs> may not be much more left. And that will definitely drive price up. So, you know, again, if you haven't got it, you know, some guys will say, wait for the dip. They may, other guys will say, forget the dip, just buy it now because I don't know if I'll be able to, to get it later or when it'll, it'll arrive, you know, weeks, months. So it's personal choice personal choice we, we all need to make but you know having said that I, I do appreciate you guys being here with me um jesus was a long one sorry about that uh one day i will get this down to half an hour one hour <laughs> promise um okay so all right so again thank you guys for being here um take care of yourselves uh, we're all in this together it is true uh, and again you know if you don't know about our company silverbullion.com.sg uh, we do things that are different as far as storing, and we do have the 
jurisdiction of, of Singapore to, to help back up what we do, which is in your benefit. So I do hope you'll, you'll take a look at, at our company and see what we can do for you. So again, as always, take care of yourselves. And hopefully we can get together and do this again next weekend. As always, saddle up for what's coming ahead and silver up as well. I'll see you guys. Take care.